Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, February 9th. We will be picking up in Genesis chapter 2, Bereshit chapter 2 and verse 5. But we have just come through a, a high note of seeing that we have been introduced at the end of verse 4, I believe it is, or the middle of verse 4, to the words, Lord God. We saw that God is Elohim, the strong one who is faithful. This is the creator God. We saw him show his power in the fact that he's the one who created the earth. But then we were introduced to a new name when it talked about the one who created man. This is not someone different. This is just a different name for our one true and living God, the name Yehovah. We broke it down from Yahweh, from all the, the variations that are in it last time, so I won't go over that. But this name is the covenant-keeping God, and when God's working in relationship to his people, this is the name of choice that he seems to use repeatedly through the scriptures. So where God, Elohim, created the earth, Yahweh, Yehovah, created man. Again, they're one and the same, just looking at the, the attributes in a slightly different way. Elohim, God commands regarding judgment, coming judgment. We saw, or we looked at it very quickly, but Genesis chapter 6 is the time of Noah. It's the time of the flood. The flood is the judgment. Yet when that judgment is going to come that Elohim has declared, it's Yahweh that shuts the ark door with Noah safely inside. So in his covenant keeping attribute he is the one who protects uh, Noah and that's chapter 7 verse 16 we saw that the earth that means the Gentile nations that they're to know Elohim they're to know who this Elohim is that he exists so even though we call him the God of Israel he's not meant for Israel alone he's not meant for just the Jewish people but he's going to be seen in that powerful state to the nations that show this is a living God no other God is alive. Every other God is a dead God. It, they're made out of stone. They're made out of stubble. They're made out of whatever. Wood. They're carved images. They're not alive. There's only one God who is alive. This is Elohim. Yet when he works in relation to Israel, saves Israel, brings her out of Egypt, etc., 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 because her whole history is nothing but God rescuing her, he uses that name Yahweh again, Yehovah the covenant-keeping God. So when we get down to Yehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, we hear in, uh, and this is Second Chronicles, chapter 18, um, 31, 32 in particular, the verses I'm, I'm bringing out, but again, look at the context. But he cried out to Yehovah. He cried out to the God that he knew is the one that, that is in that covenant relationship to help him. And even though the Syrians... <coughs> This God was unknown to them. Elohim, the powerful God, the strong one who is faithful, worked on the Syrians to help cause them to have a heart and a mind to do what his will is. That's amazing power. When some, well, I can't say someone because there is no someone. Only God can do this where he can move in those who are not his children to do his purposes. Do we see that today? Oh, oh. open up your newspapers and open up your Bible and absolutely we see it all the way through biblical history where the world was doing what they thought God was doing what he had planned through this agency called man it amazes me he doesn't just work in his children but he works on those who are not his to still do his purposes. So you have a, a, an Augustus Caesar who puts out a, an edict that everybody has to go back to their hometowns to be taxed so that pregnant Miriam, nine months along, isn't going to give birth to the Messiah in Nazareth because Micha, Micah, the prophet, said it had to be in Bethlehem, Beit Lechem, the house of bread, because he's the bread of life. She goes down in a pregnant state. She wouldn't have gone otherwise. But the edict made it happen. Did Augustus Caesar say, hmm, i got to get this pregnant woman down here? <laughs> he had no clue. And we see that repeatedly again and again and again. We go back further in Babylonian history. We've got Cyrus named 150 years before he's born. That God said there'd be a man named Cyrus. This is what he would do. So God is amazing in that Elohim 
powerful, strong name. He is faithful. What he says, he does. What he says will be accomplished, will be accomplished. Can you take that to the bank? Sign on the dotted line. Take it in, cash it out, and enjoy the benefits of trusting in a God like that. I also brought out last week, just real shortly, and then we're totally into our new, that this name Lord in our English, the, the Anglo-Saxon, the way it has come down to us, I found very interesting, that it's the Anglo-Saxon word for bread, and that it's, or for even loaf, like a loaf of bread. We're talking about bread wheat. We're not talking slang bread money as the hippies called it in the 70s. We're talking about food, the loaf of bread. And it was because ancient English men that were very high stat, uh, stature, that they would keep their, um, they had what they called open houses. And if someone was hungry, they could come get bread from that house. They could come get their physical need met. And they knew that. So these men gained the honorable title of lords, meaning dispensers of bread. But I find that interesting that they were feeding those in need and they get the name Lord when we know our Lord is the bread of life who feeds all who are in need, says, come unto me, those who are hungry. And he feeds and he satiates. Well, he saturates us too. <laughs> so they both work. Okay, with all of that in mind, at the end of verse 4, with, with, with the sentence finishing in the day that the Lord God made earth and heaven. And in our Hebrew, it is very likely it should be a period there. Some translations put a period, some put a semicolon or something else. Um, but... I forgot a Kleenex. Roger, can you grab me a Kleenex? Thank you. The winds are blowing. My sinuses are still like doses. Pardon me. I have no idea how I got down here without a Kleenex. But anyway, um, I like the idea that there is a period there. This is the complete thought. We've spent a good little while on the creation of heaven and earth. Thank you very much. But we also are not done. Because we're going to see that we're going to be looking at a little different view and getting some details filled in. And I'm anxious for us to get to those here in chapter 2 because they're in relation to man. So, I'm a little bit interested. Why do I look like I do? Why do you look like you do? <laughs> okay, let's find out. So, starting in verse 5, let me tell you, let me preface this by saying chapter 2 is not necessarily chronological. We're going to jump around because you're going to see we talk about man being created and then later we're going to talk about the animals being created. So we know the order is chapter 1 because God made it very clear. The evening and the morning were the first day. The evening and the morning were the second day. There's your chronological order. Now remember we believe that Adam, Adam, is probably keeping records. If he didn't, it was given to Moshe in a way that Moshe could relate it, but it really, in several places, is going to sound like an eyewitness. And we're going to see that here in chapter 2. So, you know, I, what we believe really is, is Adam is filling in a few of the details as he's telling the story. He can't tell God's view. He doesn't know God's view. He doesn't know what happened before he was created. He didn't see the heavens and the earth, the trees, the fishies, the animals being created. He sees their creation. He sees the results, I should say. But he can't say that for himself, that he saw, he knew he was there. So we hear a little different phrasing of the way this comes out, and he'll touch on some more things. Uh, so, as we open up to verse 5, it says, Now no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted. For the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. Okay, if we keep that in our context and look at it from the Hebrew root, it's that God had not sent yet the rain. Okay, there wasn't rain, there's no record of rain really until after Noah's flood, or, or the flood was caused by the rains coming down from heaven. So I, I shouldn't say after, I should say at the time of Noah's <coughs> flood. What's believed that's going on here is what we have described in verse 6. So don't let it throw you that there was no shrub or tree. We know God planted those, but what he's saying is that, that at this point there wasn't any rain to water the shrubs and the trees. And that, that's what we get when we keep reading in context and we get to uh, verse 6 talking about a mist that's going to rise. But before we get there, let me tell you that what we see from chapter 1 
is that canopy around the earth. Remember we, we talked about that vapor that was there. That vapor can, canopy that we see from day two of creation before the vegetation of the trees and the shrubs, which fits in context with verse 5 here, that would have prevented air mass movements. You wouldn't have had a day like today where the wind is wreaking havoc with us, <laughs> blowing our heads off and making our noses run, okay? It that wasn't needed because um, this canopy, well, I'll tell you more how it works when we get to it, but just trust me, the canopy was in pos position there weren't things like the wind currents, there wasn't things like rain, but the earth was very fertile. All of the earth was very fertile, okay? We'll talk more about that as we break it down, but what Adam is going to present to us is that God created in stages, and we see that. We see day one, day two, day three, day four, so he's going to be bringing us that he sees God created the heavens, God created, um, well, earth first, then put life upon earth. First came plant life, then came rain. And rain didn't come for a little ways. Okay, so we just, we see again um, that, that Adam's just trying to relate to us what he knows about this earth as he sees it as at the stage and the time that he was at. We know God created the vegetation before he created man. We know he created man to uh, be in the garden and to take care of it. We'll talk about that as we come down to it. Uh, the change in temperature between daytime and nighttime would have been slight. It would have been enough, though, apparently, to cause there to be a mist that came up. That's what we're reading about in verse 6. But a mist used to rise from the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. Okay, remember we've got bodies of water. With slight changes of temperature, it can put out... I don't want to call it a fog because that's a little too strong, but y'all know today, with since the fall, if you go down to the beach areas, there's a whole lot more fog than the desert areas, okay? So around the areas, the bodies of water, even with the slight temperature changes, it was all perfectly suited to man, but there would have been apparently enough to cause a bit of dew to come up, to cause a bit of, of the mist I'm going to say mist because that's a little less than fog in my mind, so I think it's a better word. And apparently God saw to it with the canopy that this was spread far enough to, to uh, nourish the earth with whatever was needed. Um, he certainly didn't put a hose in Adam's hand and say, go out and water way out there. <laughs> and really, I don't believe there was desert at this point. I believe that it was all far more fertile than the dry deserts. And I know there is a desert that blooms like a rose. That's God's description even of the future of Israel. Israel, a lot of it is desert land. I'm not saying anything against deserts. God loves variety, but I'm saying there was no lack. There was no need. This mist that came up watered the whole surface of the ground. That gives us the indication the whole earth was being taken care of. Verse 7. Then the Lord God... Uh, I'm sorry, I almost said perform, sorry. <laughs> then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground. Okay, he formed man. The rest of creation, Adam skips right over it. Doesn't tell us about the trees, the birds, the bees, the fishies, the cattle, the doggies. He just skates right over it. And he goes from the fact that there was, was everything that was needed to make the earth... Um, um, full of vegetation, I can't think of the word I want, fertile, I'll use it again. It goes right into the fact that he created, he formed man. He's going to talk about how he formed man, yes. Well, what about um, verse 24 or <clears throat> chapter 1? It says, as God said, let the earth bring forth living creature. That's God creating the living creatures. So it's not... We have to jump around here? Is this what you're saying? In chapter 2, we're jumping around. Okay. We're going, oh. we're leaping past chapter 1, verse 24, and we're going to verse 26. He just skipped everything in between. So all he, his intent right now is, hey, I want to tell you about me. I want to tell you how God made me. He made me fearfully and wonderfully, we know from the Psalms, but he wants to describe that. So he's going to bypass that God created all these other things first, and he's just going to move right into man being created. 
Um, this is the record of man's creation. It's the first state of humankind in history. Again, not chronological. We're skipping everything else God created. But this is, because look at, let me just prove my point. Chapter 2, where we're at, but go down to verse 19. 19 says, out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field. That's what um, I was just questioned about. Well, wait a minute, what about that? We saw that in chapter 124, that that happened before Adam happened. Right, right, this isn't chronological. So Adam's jumping around. He's telling you, hey, God made me. And then I see what God created. God made the animals. He's not meaning he made them after me, but he's saying, I see what else God created. That he puts himself first in that, that position because that's his most intent point right now. He wants you to know how he was formed, for lack of a better word, how he was energized, how he became a living being. Okay, that's what he's all excited about. I think he's got a right to be all excited. He is a, a wonderful creation of God. So here's, here's his story. Here's how he's telling it. We're back now in verse 7 again. The Lord God formed man of the dust from the ground. Okay, the basic chemical elements of the earth are used to be our physical elements. We know we're made out of the minerals that we find in the earth. We know that's why we need minerals in our diet. That was brought out very clear to one of our people in our uh, time just before we started class today that, that she's lacking nutrients that are needed. It is very interesting that what was making up the earth, God used to form man, the basic elements, okay? Now, he also uses, and he says it very clearly here, you made out of the dust of the earth. I don't know about you, but I don't value dust. <laughs> I wipe up dust. I try to get <laughs> dust out of my house. And I think the point here is what we're made out of isn't anything spectacular. We can't look at these minerals or the dust of the ground and say, wow, look at man, and then start worshiping man. No, God took the humble, the simple, the nothing, the basic, and he organized. I don't like that. That sounds too, he, he created, he created, he formed, okay? He formed into something special, yes. We'll talk about why that becomes special in a moment, but let me show you that dust in scripture is symbolic of little worth of lowliness, of humility. It's not just my opinion. Let me show you in Scripture. Go to Bereshit, Genesis. Go to chapter 18. I think you'll be able to find that one probably as quickly as my tablet can. Genesis 18, and we're going to look at verse 27. Genesis 18, 27 has Avraham talking, and Avraham replies, and he says, Now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord. I, I took it on me, I, I had to speak to the Lord, to, the, to our God of creation, although I am but dust and ashes. So Abraham was saying, I'm worthless. You know, I think they used to say, and maybe with inflation we're a little more costly now, but I think they used to say that we're worth about 75 cents in our elements if we, if we you know, disintegrated the, what would be left is about 75 cents. So I'll, I'll round it up to a dollar, give us all, because I think they were saying that when I was a kid, so it maybe it's a little more now. Go with me to First Shmuel, First Samuel, and we're going to go to First Samuel 2. And verse 8. Okay, tablet. Maybe it's me. First Samuel chapter 2 and verse 8. And here we read, He raises the poor from the dust. He lives the need, lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with nobles and inherit a seat of honor. So you notice how a noble man was considered an honored position. But here he's saying the poor, we're just dust. The needy, we're just from the ash sheep. Like Abraham, I'm just dust and ashes. What value is there in me? Go to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 16. 1 Kings chapter 16. Not far from Samuel. And 1 Kings 16 verse 2. 
inasmuch as I exalted you from the dust and made you leader over my people Israel. And you've walked in the way of Jeroboam and have made my people Israel sin. God's taking Israel to task. He's taking the kings to task who have not caused Israel to follow the Lord their God. But he's saying, I exalted you, Israel. I brought you up out of the dust of the ground. So we see the dust is considered lowly, is considered a humble position, is considered uh, not much value. And um, that, that's what's being declared here, that it's not anything. God didn't use gold to make us, and we're, we're, we have great value. He didn't use something, some precious mineral that you can't get anywhere else that would make it valuable, make man want themselves. No, he just used simple dust of the ground. That's not what made him special. But when we go back to Genesis 2 and we continue reading, this is where we find out why and how we are special. We see a, a precious young creation in our uh, Zoom room today, which is perfect because she's a great example for us <laughs> of uh, how wonderful and beautiful God has created. Um, notice what makes her special. The same thing that makes her grandmother special and all the rest of us also. And we read that after God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being a living person, a living soul, depending on your translation. With that divine breath, man became a living being. He was like the other forms of animal life. They had a soul. They have in the Hebrew, chaynefesh. They were a living soul. The animals were alive. But only man, the only one, where we read that God breathed in and man came to life. That's what made man a living being. Remember we saw in Genesis 1, go back to chapter 1, go to verse 26 and 27 where we have man created. God speaking, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them rule over all the, the different, everything God had created. Verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. So we are formed out of the dust of the earth, but created in the image of God who breathed in, and we became a living soul. Until God breathed in, that dust that, that formed head, shoulders, arms, legs, what do I say, it just laid there? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't moving. It wasn't doing anything. I don't want to go to zombies and <laughs> all of that in your mind, but I want you to see what makes us special is God breathed divine breath into us. When he breathed into us, it directly imparted life. That's when life began for us. Now, notice, if, and I should have kept you there, when you look on your own, or if you can flip back quickly, look at chapter 1, Look at verses 20 and 24, and you'll see, well, let's just do it. It's right there. Let's just see. This is where God created the animals, because they're alive also. I have no argument with that. Verse 20, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures. Let the birds fly above the earth, open expanse of the heavens. So obviously, if they're flying and if they're swarming, they're alive. Verse 24, God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things, beasts of the earth after their kind, and it was so. So obviously, when he made the fish, the birds, and the, the animal, the land beasts, they were alive. God spoke, and they came to life. That's all he had to do, spoke, and they came to life. Now, he could have done that with man. He could have spoken to man to come alive, and man would have. But he chose to do something different. He chose, <laughs> do you like it this way? Mouth to mouth, only not resuscitation. <laughs> but he chose to breathe in his very breath, which is eternal, which is alive, which is greater than, than the lesser breath. And, and man too. became a living being. What? And more personal too. And more personal, far more. That's what I want you to get. Only man is created in the image of God and breathed in by God. Wow. That does put us up here. 
that does leave everything else down here on this level. And I do want you to see that. The breath of life can only come from the living God. Couldn't come from any other God. Couldn't come from organisms. Couldn't come from slime on a riverbank. Couldn't go bang and come together and suddenly be male and female and reproduce. How low, <laughs> okay? That's just such... Well, it's worse than ignorance. There's another word for it. It's not nice for me to say, but... <laughs> All right, if you didn't get it, I'm saying it's stupid, okay? <laughs> I'm just going to say it. This is the way we began, and it makes so much more sense, and it takes so much less faith to believe in a living God who breathed into man, and man became a living soul. Because of that, this God, who does say in Yochanan, in John 14, 6, I am the way... I am the truth. I am the life. He's the life. He's the life giver. This one is eternal. We know that he is God before eternity and he is God after eternity. And you say, oh, wait a minute, Michelle. Wait a minute. I don't understand that. Explain that to me. And I'll tell you. I'll explain it when we're in heaven. <laughs> because there's no way our finite mind can grasp it. But the same way that we trust by faith that we can breathe in the air we can't see and we can sit on a chair that's not going to collapse and we use our faith all the time. We just simply put our faith in a living God who has proven himself to be powerful enough to sustain our lives and to carry us into an eternity that never ends. This is our living God and he imparted his breath into us. We became a living soul so our living soul the very essence of what makes us alive also is eternal. What's of God cannot stop. It can't end. It can't die. God does not die. Even when he in the human flesh of Yeshua, Jesus, we say Jesus died on the cross, what died was the human flesh, the, sh the shell that encapsulated the soul. The soul of Yeshua he said to the thief, today you will be with me in paradise. He didn't say you will sleep in the dust of the earth. You'll awaken sometime later. He said you will be with me in paradise today. That's where the soul of Yeshua, the very soul of God, went in those three days that his body lay in the tomb. But his soul did not. The soul wasn't there. And hello, side note, his soul did not go into hell. Okay, he went into the paradise side. When he said on the cross, it is finished, put a period there and don't add on anything after that for our salvation. He shed his blood. It was sinless blood. It was perfect blood. It would be placed on the mercy seat in the heavens. There was nothing else that needed to be added. He did not need to go into hell and suffer for three days in hell and come out of hell, nothing comes out of hell. Nothing comes out of hell. Okay? And hell was made for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, 41. It was not made for man. But man's eternal soul lives forever. When you came to life, it's because God's breath is in you. It continues on forever. That's why it is so important to know where will your soul the very essence of your being, where will it spend eternity? Because it's not going to go into the grave with you if you get buried here on earth. It's going to go somewhere. And we know that the great divide is based on that shed blood that I just described. In the shed blood, eternity in heaven with our Lord forever. Because it's eternal. Without that shed blood, separated from God, forever because it is still eternal it just can't be in the presence of the God that it has rejected and when I say it that's a he or a she that's not a, a an it it okay so the animals we don't see have that kind of make makeup the essence because God didn't breathe into them now as soon as I say that every pet lover is saying but wait a minute I want my pets in heaven fine if you need your pets to be happy in heaven, so be it. God will have your pets in heaven. I don't have any problem with that. I do not have scripture and verse that says this is how it is, but I trust my loving God. Okay? 
but we're talking now about the breath of life from God the Father, from Elohim that breathed into us. Rhonda, unmute yourself so I can hear your question, please. She's trying. Okay. Um, I heard, um, I don't know how accurate this is, that in the original scriptures, um, when it talks about you shall surely die uh, if you do X, Y, or Z, uh, it said you shall surely. It said you shall surely die. Die. Yes. Die was twice. When like thy flesh, thy soul. When we get to that verse, <laughs> we're going to see that the Hebrew says, "Dying, you shall surely die." And we do see that what is being referred to is the spiritual and the physical there. So we'll go into a deeper explanation of it at the time. But yes, when and, and I'll jump ahead with you because you might not be here at that class and I don't want to be left dangling. When Adam and Eve sinned, when they had eaten from that fruit that they were not to eat from, they were told if they ate that fruit they would die. That's one of the things that Satan deceived Eve with. You know, I'm touching it, I've eaten it, I'm not dying, or I'm not dead, I didn't die. You know, and he makes it pleasurable to her. But what it does say is dying you shall surely die. The moment they ate it, they immediately started into physical death that would not show up in Adam's case for 900 and well we don't know how long before he he said but he lived a, what 930 years so obviously it wasn't that he suddenly was going to shrill up and die but his body started the process of the cells breaking down and of the body breaking down the organs later breaking down we know that that the moment we're born we're starting to die it just takes some of us longer than others, <laughs> okay? But that, that was absolutely true. They cut themselves off spiritually. We haven't even talked about it yet, but physically the consequence was the body would decay now. The body would go back to those elements I've talked about. they go back to dust. Go dig up George Washington's grave. You're not going to find George Washington in there looking pretty. You're going to find ashes. Dust to dust. Dust to dust. Ashes to ashes. Yes, that's why they say that at, at a funeral service. But also, and more critically important, at that moment, they died spiritually. They cut off the relationship between a holy God and his creation. And the consequences are felt on every level to great degree, the greatest degree, even down to us today. But thankfully, God knew and had a solution already in play for us that we've already begun to talk about. So when we get there, we'll, we'll talk about it more. But yes, absolutely, dying, um, you shall surely die, is the Hebrew, and it is speaking to the two deaths. Yes, Dosi? Adams was the first man created, right? Yes. <clears throat> and you imagine how special he was? Yes. I wonder did he do that? Well, let's see what he thought when he when we get just a little further in chapter two and he sees the other things God created. Hold on to that thought. Remind me if I don't bring it back out, but let's see what, what that made him think, okay? Um, but I will agree with you. In fact, really, man is, is the perfect unity of God's creation because the angels that we know God created, they have spirits. They, spirits, that's an S on the end, <laughs> okay? Um, but they're, they don't have material being. And then you've got the earth, which is material existence, but it doesn't have the spirit. Then you have mankind, and mankind is a combination of God's material and his spirit. He put the two together, and it reflects him better than anything else because we were made in his image so yes man was very special created very specially he will live somewhere eternally this also does away with any teachings of annihilation and if you want further proof revelation 20 and verse 10 at the beginning of the millennium and millennium means thousand okay at the beginning of a thousand years the um, false prophet and the beast have been thrown into hell. They don't wait for the great white throne judgment. Okay, let me go to Revelation 20.10. I'm thinking something and I want to say it before. I just want to be as accurate as I possibly can. 
and and I do. I I pulled it back in my mind. I'm okay. I'm on track. But Revelation 20:10, uh, I will read to you. Says, and the devil who deceived them. This is Satan. This is Lucifer. Whatever you want to call him, was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone. That's hell, where the beast and the false prophet are also. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Okay? Now, the beast and the false prophet were thrown in at the beginning of the millennium. They were not uh, even given the... Uh, what do I call it? They are, they're not going to stand before God at the great white throne judgment. They were Their sins were so bad. God didn't even bring them up for judgment like he does all the rest of, of humankind. He just immediately sent them to their eternal... Um, state which is in hell fire and brimstone burning forever now that happened at the beginning of the millennium at the end of the millennium the thousand years have passed you have verse 10 here the the verse I just read yes verse 10 they're still there they haven't burned up and become ashes in a thousand years and it says that they're going to be tormented forever so there goes annihilation and why? Because the Spirit of God cannot die. That Spirit has to live on. It is eternal because it is a part of God. God breathed in and we became the living soul. So that Spirit, separated from God, right there is torment. I don't care anything else, fire or not, whether it's a, an analogy or whether it's a reality, you're separated from God. You're separated from love. You're separated from light. You're separated from truth. You're separated from everything glorious. What is left? Horror upon horror upon horror. This is torment. And I can only imagine when they're there thinking, if I had only chosen, I wouldn't have to be here. Because man has no one to blame but himself when he ends up in hell. He can't stand before God and say, it's your fault, God. If you had only, because God will have all the answers showing mankind through the time that never a man was able to, to rise up to a perfect, holy standard. And if God allowed that lack into heaven, what would heaven be like in time? Hell on earth. Another way to put it. Yes. So does the millennium start the thousand years when God brings his to heaven? When um, when Jesus comes yeah. to earth, stops the battle of Armageddon? Oh, no, I mean when he sets his kingdom, kingdom yes. on earth. Yes. Is that when it starts? Yes. Okay. Yes. And that's at the end of the tribulation. Next thing is that yellow on our chart, the yellow circle, the millennial kingdom, thousand years. And at the end of that time, Satan's been allowed to go through, gather everyone who wants to follow him instead of God. They come up to dethrone God, and God says, done. Great white throne, and we go off into eternity. We do not stand at the great white throne judgment. I hear people slip and say, well, you know, one day at the great white throne judgment. Oh, no, you don't want to stand there because only the unsaved stand at the great white throne judgment. We have been rewarded or lost our rewards long time prior at the Bema seat of Yeshua Jesus. I believe that's taking place while the tribulation is going on down here on earth because we come back in our robes of righteousness. We come back ruling and reigning. So I believe we've, we've received by that point. So uh, uh, that gives you that long line again, just, just to summarize it. Um, but again, um, I'm looking at my notes to make sure I gave you everything, and I think I did. No annihilation. This is why hell is necessary also. People always say, well, that's a mean God. <laughs> really? <laughs> really? God's mean? When man has chosen to reject him, his love, his salvation, knowing this consequence, and no one is without excuse. So yes, it is revealed to man. And man does know, a man does choose. To say you're sitting on the fence is really not true. You're either for the Lord or you're against Him. There really isn't an in-between. We see people coming close to accepting, but they're still, if they were to die in that state, they have not accepted. So that's why when people say, well, you know, I'll, I'll put it off, maybe I'll pray tonight, 
or I, I'll do it when I go to church on Sunday or something like that. They're playing with fire, and I mean that literally. They're playing with hellfire because they may not make it to tonight or to the church, and there's no place you need to be to open your heart to the Lord. You can open your heart to the Lord in the shower, in the street, in, the, in your house, Wherever you are, anywhere, it's, it's an internal, it's opening the heart. So, um, no excuse, no annihilation either though. And again, where would the fairness be if they stopped, then our eternal exuberance, our eternal glory, would also maybe come to an end, because it's the same word. You live eternally. Wherever you live, you live eternally. So if they got annihilated, if they got finished off, then we'd have to think we get glory for a little while and we get finished off. No, thank you. I want it forever. And <laughs> it's mine forever. Yeah. So, okay. Any other questions, comments? Are we good? Okay. Then I think we're ready for verse 8. Let me go back to Genesis. Am I in chapter 1 now? I am. Let me get back to chapter 2 and look at verse 7. But I think we have it. The Lord God formed man of the dust from the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That's what made man become a living being. Then verse 8 tells us the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden. Now, Hebrew says the Lord had planted. He'd already planted a garden. We know he made a beautiful earth. But notice there is a garden in Eden. Again, this is why we believe, and that the Hebrew says, toward the east or to the east. So there was direction. In our, in our sphere, our globe, we know we've got north, south, east, and west. So looking toward the east, this is where God planted the garden, and he planted the garden in Eden. That means, I believe, that the original name for earth was Eden, that God is calling all of it Eden, because he planted a garden in Eden. Follow me? Just, just mm -hmm. a thought, but I believe it to be so. The garden, I mean, the earth is not all Eden. I'm saying that wrong. The earth is all Eden, I think. And God planted a garden in Eden. Okay, but Eden then would be more than just the garden. Eden would be the rest of the earth that we know that God created. Um, another proof for that is Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel Chapter 28 and verse 13. We've looked at this before because this is the fall of Satan, and we know that this was his kingdom down here. And in verse 13 of Ezekiel 28, it says, When God was speaking to Satan, you were in Eden, in the Garden of God. So again, it sounds like Eden was God's name for what we're calling earth. Of course, we have the Recreated, I'll say that safely because you were with me in chapter one. You know what I mean by that. So people always wonder, well, where was the Garden of Eden? Where would that be? We get a few little hints from our following verses in Genesis. I can't get back to. There we go. Okay, we get a few little hints as to where it might have been, and I will go through that with you, but most believe that the lower Babylonia area near the head of the Persian Gulf, that that is most likely the place where it was. It's called sometimes the Fertile Crescent. And I'm going to ask Roger to put up that map that I had for us earlier um, so that you can see it. Um, the reason why we think that is because of some of the names that were given of the, the rivers that ran through the garden. Um, but you have to realize the flood changed the face of the earth. So nobody can say exactly, oh, this is it. But it sounds quite likely this is the area. So here we have a picture. Um, don't, you don't need to worry about reading everything that's on it. But, okay, are they looking at it this way too? Yeah. Okay, so on your right where it says Persian Gulf, the, the area with water would be right there. The two main lines that look like they're cracked are, are the rivers Tigris and Euphrates that we'll talk about those names very shortly. Notice, just for sake of curiosity, there's a star a little lower than the half point in, in the middle on the map that says Babylon, if you can read it. That is where Babylon is today. Oops. I'm sorry. Bring it, yeah. Actually, yeah, bring it back up for a minute because Babylon's not on the other one. Then you can go to the second one. He's trying to share it with you all. 
Um, so it'll come back up in a second. Yeah, they should still see it full size, though. Here, here, here. Did you want to go under? There we go. Oh, okay. They're still seeing it full size? Yeah. Sorry, it took a minute to help my kitty. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, but I think it's hard for us here to see it now. If we can get it bigger again for a moment. Yeah. Okay. While he's doing it again, what, you, what you'll just see, just out of curiosity, is Babylon. Um, we won't talk about ba Babylon until finally we'll talk about the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. There we go. Okay, if you can't read it, he just circled it. Mm -hmm. And then on each side, you got Tigris and Euphrates, which are two of the rivers we're going to talk about. When they talk about it being the Persian Gulf, that's on our right, just off of this map on the right, two-thirds of the way down. There you go. Okay, so it's, it's likely that it could have been in that area. What's very interesting is Revelation 18, and I'll go there if you don't want to, you can just listen, but Revelation 18 mentions this area. Revelation 18, verses 2 and 3, and we read, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. I missed the start of it. And he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. This is an angel crying out. She has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison of every unclean spirit, a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality. The kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her. The merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality. The whole earth is played in to this area, to this Babylon. And then if you go down to verse 10, we have standing at a distance, the king, well, verse 9 tells us the kings of the earth who had been um, committing all these acts with her. In verse 10, they're standing at a distance because of the fear of her torment, saying, whoa, whoa, the great city Babylon, the strong city, for one hour your judgment has come. Drop down to verse 21 in this same chapter. Verse 21, then a strong angel took up a stone like a great millstone, threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will not be found any longer. Now, it is believed this is the area of the Antichrist headquarters during the tribulation. The Antichrist indwelt by Satan, Satan's man on earth that he is using because he's trying to get back earth, the kingdom that he has lost. And it only makes, uh, what's the word I want? It's not that it makes sense, but once again, what do we see that Satan tries to do? He tries to counterfeit God. Every time we turn around, he tries to counterfeit God. Okay? God's a holy trinity. Satan tries to make himself antichrist, false prophet, and himself a, a false trinity. Everything God tries, I mean, everything God does, Satan tries to counterfeit. So, if God set up civilization here, put his man in the garden in this area, wouldn't it make sense that this is the area that Satan would target and say, no, it's mine. I'm going to put my man there, and I'm going to rule the earth from here. So, it just kind of makes sense. This is the Babylon that we're talking about. So, is it one in the same place? Yes, Babylon, we know where it was. We know where it is. And when, when Scripture talks about Babylon in chapter 18, I do believe it's talking about a literal place. We have that Babylon is to be destroyed in uh, Jeremiah. I think it's also in Isaiah. Um, but my point being there is there must be two destructions of Babylon because the way that God said Babylon would be destroyed, and here you have uh, in chapter 18, we've read some of that, that has never happened. There's other prophecies, other scriptures that say that, that no stones from Babylon would be used. Well, ancient Babylon's stones have been used to build a palace in current Babylon for Hussein when he had a palace there. So, obviously, if God says no stone ever will, and the angels told us that it's, it's going to be violently destroyed in an hour and never rise again, then... This hasn't happened yet. So I fully believe that Babylon is still on our map and even know where it is because God is still working with that area to fulfill his prophecy. Remember again, man thinks he's doing his own thing, but even unsaved man is working into God's plan, doing what God has, has 
ordained that would be what would take place. So just find it very interesting. I, I think fully we've got Satan mimicking and we've got God's reality. So I wouldn't be surprised at all if this wasn't the area, but I'm not telling you it's exactly the area. Now if you pull up that second map, Roger, that's where it shows you, it calls it the Fertile Crescent. It just doesn't put Babylon on the map, but you may have heard of the Fertile Crescent and history and you know in your classes sometime or if you've been studying you know at other times the yeah the little map bring that one up um, there's Mesopotamia another area a name that you're used to you can see Tigris and Euphrates there you can see the Persian Gulf the water there so that area um, probably about where the A in the first A in Mesopotamia is would be about where Babylon would be they just didn't, you know, list us why I did the other map first, okay? So just because if you're like me, it helps to see, to be able to retain. So wherever it was, but we think it quite likely to be in this area, as we go back to Genesis, we find out that this is where God put man. See, we haven't stopped to think about it, but God had a whole earth. He could have put man anywhere on that earth. This is where we believe that he did put man, okay? And... We have, again, now this is where it begins to sound like that first-hand description, okay? We're going to get a bit of a description. We know that, that God planted a garden toward the east, or um, we got noise. I think it's going by a bit in just a second. I have to laugh. I always feel like interference comes from sin. We don't have the street sweeper go by on Wednesday afternoon, but it comes by while I'm teaching class on the day that I have the door open. But you know what? All that street sweeper is doing is stirring up dust to remind us that, that God made man <coughs> special out of the dust of the earth. And while it's being carried out to the trash, it just reminds me <laughs> of Satan's hand. <laughs> So, I love it. Satan can drive it. We win because we're in God. <laughs> okay? So, back here, back in verse 8. Uh, there he placed the man whom he had formed. He formed Adam. I, I, I think about that. I don't think it took a long time, but he was forming man. He formed him with two eyes, with a nose, with a mouth. He formed him with two arms and two legs. He formed him with, with ten fingers. He formed him with thumbs. Do you know how important your thumbs are? If you've ever lost the use of a thumb for some time, and I see a few heads, including my own, shaking yes, you know that thumb is critical. That's another thing that shows us that we were fearfully and wonderfully created by our God. That didn't just evolve because we needed thumbs, because then show me the ones that are evolving that don't have thumbs. They're not there. But God made us. He made us. He formed us very specially. And then when he formed this man, he placed this man in the garden. Verse 9, out of the ground, the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. Okay, let's stop right there because I'll make sure I've given you everything. Um, and I think I have up to that point. Okay, good. I didn't miss anything. Now, when he says he placed or he put the man, here's where it begins to sound like somebody's telling us what happened to them. This is kind of like Adam's, Adam's witness to us. It was his first knowledge of his creator was that his creator loved him and provided for him carefully, abundantly, beautifully, wonderfully, all of these words. God had formed him, and then he put him in the garden. And I can only imagine that garden must have been just gorgeous, so fertile and so beautiful, and this is all that Adam would know. He would know dried up, and he would know sparseness. He would know the prolific beauty because it says that God caused to grow every tree that's pleasing to the sight and good for food. Okay, now he caused that to come out of the ground. The seed was in the ground already. Genesis 1, 11, and 12 tells us that God, he not only created the trees, but the seeds in the trees to continue, and the plants and everything else. So when it says that it came out of the ground, that he caused to grow every tree, that's, he's talking about the seeds. And we all know that. You plant a seed, you grow a tree. 
or you grow whatever you know you are growing so that's all that is meaning there and when it says that he caused it he made it to happen now we know he made those trees before he created Adam but all Adam knows is those trees are there and what does he know of them they're pleasing they're beautiful to Adam's sight why because God is a God of beauty and here comes the street sweeper again. <laughs> I would close up and it'll get stuffy in here. You know, Adam didn't need to sweep the garden. <laughs> the dust didn't get out of control. <laughs> okay, so if he's he sees all this beauty, all that he sees are trees that are pleasant to the sight. I can imagine, I mean, I look at the variety of trees. You go into the mountains and it's the pine trees. You look out in your yards and you see trees that turn colors in the fall. Not that that was happening then. Uh, well, it could have because they did have seasons. God created the seasons, we know that. But still, you see, you know, a liquid amber tree. You see a, a magnolia tree. You see the fruit trees everything gorgeous and the fruit trees bring me to the next part because it said that it was good for man or good for food I'm sorry good for food he, God was mindful of man's need he made man to eat those of you who are afraid you're gonna to get to heaven and not eat why God made us to eat and we know that there's trees up in heaven we know that there's one tree that will have a different fruit it, it sounds like every month in our timing 12 different kinds of fruit out of the year Wow no, God, God knows. He made us with those needs and, and the fulfillment of those needs. So everything that Adam would need for life to continue, everything that Adam would, would crave or want, I don't know that there were cravings and there weren't needs in the way that we're saying yet because there was no sin. But he, God was mindful and he created gorgeous for Adam. Now, he did create the tree of life. And this is important because we see when we get to Genesis 3, and we can jump there. We can go ahead to the next chapter. Look at verses 22 and 24. This is after the sin, after the fall. Genesis 3, 22 says, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And we'll talk about all this in order. No worries. And now he might stretch out his hand. Take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Okay, that's a problem because he's in a sinful state now. He's in a separation from God in that way. So God does not want him in that sinful state living forever. That's why verse 24, so he drove the man out. Out of, and at, at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherry beam and the fly, flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Adam and Eve could not sneak back into the garden and take from the fruit of the tree of life because apparently the tree of life had in it, um, and this is hard, we have to think how we can phrase things before sin and after sin, um, I'm not telling you that it had anything by our standards of health. I'm not telling you that he would have been sick if he didn't eat from it, but apparently it had life-giving properties in it. It had a profusion that would have kept Adam in a healthy state and living continually. But if he had stayed that way and stayed in his sinful state, he would have stayed separated from God forever. That's why God says, no, I'm not going to have him live forever in a sinful state. So I'm going to block his way to the tree of life, and he cannot eat and live forever. His body will decay. He eventually will die. And that's because God planned the resurrection and the life, you know, the new that, that we receive. We know when we leave this earth in God, saved in God, that we are, are taken from mortal into immortality, that we will not age anymore. We will live forever. This tree of life is in heaven. Revelation 22, 2 is the tree of life in the New Jerusalem described there. And it says it's growing in profusion and for the health of the nation. So again, apparently it holds back the aging process. It's something man's not going to be able to scientifically say, oh, I get it, I understand it here, you need to take this supplement. No, it's God's way of, of putting into man what he made man to need to continue to live forever. So, 
That was a very special tree, the tree of life. There was another tree in the garden, a very unique tree also. The tree, and I'm sure you're ahead of me, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, we need to talk about that one. I'm trying to get back to Genesis 2. And my tablet does not want to cooperate. The first evil tree in the Bible. Roger's saying the first evil tree, but we really can't say that. Okay, my tablet is locked up on me. Let me see if I can go. Okay, I found another way around it. I'm back to Genesis 2. Sorry for the delay. Okay, and um, we're still in verse 9. Yes, we're still in verse 9. Out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree that's pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, man already knew good. He knew good by looking and seeing that God had provided everything pleasant and good for him, the, the trees to eat from, the garden to be living in. He only knew good from God's hand. He did not know anything else. He would come to know evil experientially or experimentally, however you want to put it. He's going to experience that, but he doesn't know it. He will experience it when he disobeys, when he eats the fruit that he was not supposed to eat. So it was called this because this was to test man's obedience. Would man be obedient to God and not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? If Adam and Eve had never eaten from it, then evil would not exist in the world the way that it does today. We know that, but here's, here's the test the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But to this point, evil, what's that? All Adam knows is good. Okay, loving hand of a loving God providing good for his creation. Let's go on and get a little more of the description. Uh, but again, you see how it sounds like Adam's telling us what his garden looked like? Tree of life was in the midst of it. There was also another tree. It was called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But there were a lot of other trees pleasing to the sight and, and all kinds of things to eat from those trees. Now he's going to tell us a little more. Now a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. From there it divided and became four rivers. Okay, when it says out of Eden to water the gardens, it's not meaning it synonymously. It sounds like, you know, there was water on top, but pr probably what he's describing is underground rivers that sprang up, fed the ground, so that it came out of Eden, out of the earth, okay? Because remember, if Eden's the name of the earth, and it came out of the earth. That fits with the fact that that canopy that we talked about that had the dew in the midst around the bodies of water, here's your springs of water out of the earth that are feeding other parts that are further away. <laughs> like a sprinkler, okay. It pops up yeah, back. yeah, okay. The pops up, <laughs> okay. I know when I've been in Israel and seen one of the three starts of the Jordan River, you have to think with a far bigger mind because in my little mind I see this puny little stream and it gets a little bigger as it goes down. No, the head of of the Jordan Rivers that I saw rushing water wide, you know, I mean, it was not a small little, it was a lush area, very lush. The first time I was there, the soldiers were there refreshing themselves, having a little break in the afternoon. They had taken watermelons, put watermelons in the water so that they had chilled. It was a natural refrigerator. They pulled out that watermelon and shared with us. We had some of the best watermelon. <laughs> and uh, I could tell you other stories around, but my point being, it wouldn't be just a little stream. This would be a gushing that comes up to feed whatever was needed. God put it all in. The earth had what it needed also. They call them artesian springs today. Tor wants to call them sprinklers. <laughs> okay. Um, this was probably necessary where the trees were because the vapor, the mist, and the dew wouldn't have been a, a good, healthy drink. And if trees were the same then as they are now, we know that they need deep water. They need lots of water for the roots to go down and be strong roots so that when the wind comes, the tree stays. Now, there was no wind. There was no worry of that. But still, if God didn't change the way the trees were, they were made to drink deep. And this would have provided the depth for them. Because, again, remember, no rain 
until Noah's day. So the, the, the springs, these springs, this river, whatever that comes up, that divides itself, it, it parts or it divides, whichever word your, your uh, version has is fine, and it became four rivers or four heads of rivers, four different waters. We're going to see the four are named, two of them we recognize today. So we know these are our separate streams. So again, it would be where the spring comes up and feeds one, and the spring comes up and feeds another. You know, that, that this is what we are seeing. So, what are they called? Verse 11, the name of the first is Pishon. I may not be pronouncing it right. Some believe that the Pishon is like a canal that connects the Tigris and Euphrates. Remember how close the two rivers were on the map? That, again, if we're in that fertile area, the Fertile Crescent, which fertile also because the land seemed to be so fertile there. Um, okay, see where the A is in Mesopotamia, the first A again in that area. It could be that Pishon was um, this spring that would come up that would be like a canal, like a channel that fed both the Tigris and Euphrates. Some think that, okay? They think it's not far from the Ur of the Chaldeans, which is this area. We know that that's the area Avraham came from, and he's one of our first early people in Scripture also, so again, it fits with the, the area. Um, but we can't say, oh, we know exactly where the Pishon is. Um, number one, nobody knows anything except after the flood. Pre-flood, the face of the earth was definitely different than after the flood. Great example, look at our Grand Canyon. They know that that was flood waters that rushed through or, or came through that made the layers and the divisions that, that we see. That could have happened at the time of the flood. That could have happened from other times too. I'm not the authority to say, but I tend to think it came from the flood. But my point being, the flood changed the face of the earth. So even what we have that's still named the same, we don't know if it's exactly, you know, the same exactly the place. But it's getting us in the area. So without just beating this to death, we go on. Um, Pishana says it flows around the whole land of Havala, where there is gold. So Havala is, again, an area that from its name means it's rich in minerals. And it probably, I would think, skirted around the area that we're calling Babylon, we'll call it Babylonia, um, it would have been known to Adam. And if he's writing the account, that makes sense. That he's writing what he saw and what he knew. So he's saying it was the Pishon, it was the area of Havala, and this area was rich in minerals. That all fits because God made the, the, the garden very rich. So it, it fits in you know, perfectly with our account here. Um, verse 12, the gold of the land is good. The, and you say it, it looks like a B, but you don't pronounce a B, the Delium. Um, and the onyx stone are there. Delium, as far as we know, is an aromatic gum that's similar to myrrh. And we know that they used myrrh, well, they used it in embalming and other things later, mm -hmm. but we know these are minerals that are used for mankind. So what Adam is telling us is that the minerals were there. Remember, we were made out of the earth. We were made with minerals. We just weren't made with the precious ones that are priceless. We don't have gold in us. But hey, who cares? We get to walk on the streets of gold. <laughs> we get to have it under our feet. It's the dust that we just saw the street sweeper getting rid of. <laughs> That's our dust. Okay, but it's a rich area. Going on to verse 13, the name of the second river is Gihon. Again, we don't know exactly where. It could be another canal. It could be another spring coming up. It could be another feeding the Tigris and Euphrates. Some believe that it's referring to the Nile. And if Roger brings up, I think, the second map, the Fertile Crescent one, showed the Nile on um, the left side. Yes, it is that second one that you're beginning to see. He'll get it up here in a moment. On the very left side, past the Red Sea, is the Nile River, and it's, it's named down below the Mediterranean, okay? 
because again, we've got to think large. God didn't just make a little garden that fits in your backyard and say, Adam, live here. He gave them a huge, beautiful area to explore and, and to enjoy and to see the variety and the lushness of it and all. So I have no problem if it did go all the way to the Nile, it could have. They think that because um, Cush in scripture, C-U-S-H, known today as modern Ethiopia, is south of it. But the Nile doesn't go around Ethiopia now like it did then, if that be so. Again, because the flood changed the face of the earth. So we're just guessing whether it went all the way to the Nile or not. But it could have. Okay? It could have. Um, the descendants of Ham. Noah, one of Noah's three sons, you call him Ham. Genesis 10, verses 6 and 7. I can't call him Ham because he's not kosher. <laughs> um, the Cushites. They appear to have spread after the flood from the higher area of the Nile to the Euphrates and the Tigris. Okay, so it's not unheard of for it to spread like that at a time like this. That was able to be done. Um, it would be called some of the area of modern Arabia today. But uh, either this is Adam's description, and I tend to lean toward that being so, or, and that would have been pre flood. Or it could be that Moshe, Moses, put in an editorial note. Because we know he compiled, he had the right to bring it all together, to give it the fluidity that he gave, why he's given credit to being the author of the first five books. Because he, he is the overall author that, that stamped it. It's just, you know, like when we bring in, we write something, we bring a quote from somebody. But it's still our paper, it's still us authoring it. So whether it's Adam's quote that he brought in, or whether it's his say so, if it's his, then it is describing the land after the flood. If it's Adam's, it's describing it before. You know how we'll find out? We'll go ask Adam and Moses one day. <laughs> is it your account or is it your account? Was this pre flood or was this after? That's when we'll get the, the answer. Um, when you hear something referred to as antediluvian, the dilu diluvian, the dilute, that's the flat. So it's either prior or after is what they're saying, just in case if you hear that or see that in a source, if you're studying on your own. Um, we've lost everybody on the screen. Have we lost them or are they, they can there? see you. Okay, yes. okay, then I, I get to go on with the Something's blank okay. white screen. <laughs> Verse 14, as long as you're there, that's all that matters. Verse 14, the name of the third river is Tigris. Uh, the ancient name is Hittichel, and it, it's when you read Hittichel in outside literature, it's talking about the Tigris. We've already looked at where the Tigris is, so we've seen that on the map. But here, according to verse 14, it flows east of Assyria. Now, obviously, that's an editorial note. That's not Adam's note, because Adam wouldn't know Assyria to say it's east of Assyria. All he knows is the garden. You know, he doesn't know lands that have been given names like Assyria. So that obviously would be something that Moshe put in. So, you know, I have no problem. I have no problem saying Moshe, Moses, is the author of the first five books. Just so that we're clear on that note. So, it flows east of Assyria, and because of that, now putting all this together, some think that the Garden of Eden was north of Babylon, the Tiger and the Euphrates, where they closely approach each other, that area that they, they believe went to the Persian Gulf, and that was near the origin of the Tigris and the Euphrates, which is also going up into Armenia. And I'm going to say, because of seeing the Nile, they're leading, lean, leave, leaning over toward Egypt, that whole area. Again, everybody's guessing. Nobody can tell you this is it except for those who live there who are in heaven, and we will ask them one day. Um, they call it the Near East today. They call it the Fertile Crescent. I think I've covered it well. So now that we have a description, and, and hopefully the one thing you've gotten out of this is make it big in your mind, or at least I need to. It's the same way when I, I see a sea of people and I realize how many people there are on the mm. face of this earth. You know, I don't comprehend seven billion till I see a sea of people and they say, you know, that, that's several hundred thousand. And I think, well, then how much is seven billion? <laughs> so a garden, I tend to think small. I tend to think even our lush gardens. The London Zoo, 
my first time that I ever heard or learned at a zoo that you literally can drive through. It is so large that it, it, it's, it's, I don't know how much territory it covers. Well, that's what I want you to do with the Garden of Eden. Realize God made them a beautiful place. It was not the whole of the earth, but it was a, a nice big area. And God put Adam, his creation, there. And the Lord God, verse 15, took the man, put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. Now remember, we are pre-sin. Adam wasn't working with hard soil. He didn't have to nudge it along. He didn't get pricked by thorns on the roses. He didn't have any of those issues. So what's it meaning to cultivate it? it it's tending it. Some of the old versions will say dress it and keep it. Well, that growth, because it's going to prolifically grow because everything is right for it, the amount of sun it's getting, the watering that it's getting, everything that, that God has blessed it with, it would be luxuriant growth. So it would be channeling it in the direction so it wouldn't just be overgrown. It gave Adam something to do. He was to tend it. He was to keep it. Um, the Hebrew word will even say guard. But it's not guard, I'm going to shoot down the enemy. <laughs> but be careful. Exercise stewardship toward this. Loving care. It's beautiful and it's orderly. Keep it in beauty. Keep it in order. And God gave Adam the intelligence for that. But notice he gave Adam, <laughs> I'll use it. You might call it a three-letter word, but he gave him a job. <laughs> okay? It's not good for man not to have something to do. It's not good for man not to work. God intended man to be active. And we know that this is very necessary for man's health today. The, the, the ideal world is not idleness, frolic, you know, be little fairies in the, the sky that have no responsibilities. No, we have serious activity and serious service. As when I say it's serious, I'm talking about what, what we do unto the Lord. But man... In, in his whole makeup is to be active. Remember, he's made in the image of God. You think God's just sitting on a throne doing nothing all day, and every once in a while puts out a command, thou shalt, or go do that? No, no. I, who knows but what he's still creating other things far beyond? I have no idea. I just know he's, I'm sure he's busy. Quote, I'm sure heaven is a very busy place, and that's what I want you to realize. You hear the, those, especially children growing up that are, were trying to convey heaven to them. Oh, you mean I have to sit, stand in a choir and sing? You mean I'm going to pluck a harp and I'm going to sit on a cloud? You know, and they're bored. God didn't let Adam be bored. He gave Adam work. Adam would have had the joy of of seeing how this grows and seeing how that grows because a vine grows different than the leaves on the tree. And this one produces fruit that, oh, I think I'll try this today. I wonder what this tastes like. And everything would have been another exciting discovery. Well, when we go into the service of our Lord in the heavens for all of eternity, do you think it's going to be any less? I think it's going to be even more. But I think that even more importantly, not just what was for ourselves taking in the fruits and all that which we will do i can't wait till i can eat fruit that hasn't been tainted by sin and i'm sure i'm gonna laugh and say i thought that watermelon was so good oh i hadn't tasted anything yet but we are going to be active in the service of our lord we're not going to just be sitting we're not going to be idle we're not going to be just frolicking you know no we're going to have things to do. The, it's going to give us joy to do. We're going to enjoy. We'll be discovering and learning and, and endless. But God made man's mind to be challenged. There's nothing worse than, than a mind that's unchallenged. Put a, a child in a classroom and a, a bright child and don't challenge that child's mind. And what does that child do? He gets in trouble. He starts figuring out things to do on his own. He doesn't just sit there. Well, when we're in heaven, our minds are going to be expanded to do so much more. And I can just wonder, what is God going to do with us? It's going to be exciting. And we're going to have all the eternity to explore and to learn. Yes, God blessed Adam on earth. But our expense is the heavens. 
the universes, the eternal, whoa, so much more, so much more. But what we're now entering into is that first covenant. I think I told you before that there are eight covenants in scripture. If I didn't, I'm telling you now, there are eight covenants. Uh, I think I did when we looked at the, our chart and we went through the chart. We're in the first one now. This is called the Edenic, Edenic, how do I say it? E-D-E-N-I-C, Edenic Covenant. That just simply means that it's the Garden of Eden. It's the, it's the covenant is um, a sovereign pronouncement by God in, in that he establishes a relationship of responsibility between himself and either a, an individual, mankind in general, a nation, or a specific human family. And he'll make it very clear. So the Edenic covenant is a covenant made with Eden, with Adam and Eve, obviously, because they're the ones living in Eden. So this time, I would say, is with two individuals. It's with Adam and it's with Eve. And God's going to establish a relationship with Adam and Eve, and that relationship he has a responsibility and they have a responsibility. This is a covenant between them. You know, a covenant takes two. The, the, there can be an unconditional covenant, which when God makes an unconditional covenant, he says, whether you keep up your end or not, I will. But then there are also conditional covenant, gov covenants, which means that they both have to, you know, if man breaks his, God is, is not responsible to continue what God had said. We'll see that as we look at the different ones. Sorry, I get thirsty. But again, I want to redefine it and then get Anne's question. A covenant, by definition, is a sovereign pronouncement. God is pronouncing. He is establishing a relationship. That relationship, is, there is responsibility. God is entering into responsibility with whoever's on the other end, and they with him. In this case, in the Edenic, he's entering into covenant with Adam. Adam's representing Adam and Eve, all of mankind, okay? But he, Adam's our head representative here, so this would be with an individual. Now, before I go any further with that, Anne, unmute yourself and give us your question. Well, you did what I was going to request, which was to repeat the definition. Okay. I, yeah, I realize this is where it's hard to be on Zoom. Um, you know, and I never know what to send out to people ahead of time, but yes. So I think we've got it now, though, the, the Edenic Covenant, the first of eight. And by the way, covenants can overlap each other. It doesn't mean, you know, that they all have to end. Human failure will never abolish the covenant or block its ultimate fulfillment. Parts of it may have to be set aside for the time. And if you're ahead of me and you know there are other covenants in Scripture, you know where I'm going with that one. That, that sometimes something gets put on hold and it waits to see its total fulfillment. But when the human fails, it doesn't derail God's plan. God's not up there going, oh, no, what do I do now? Hey, hey, I've got a problem. No, it doesn't abolish his covenant, and it doesn't abolish the fulfillment. God is the one who is faithful. Now, as I said, there's eight of them. Three are universal. They're general to the whole human race. Five of them are made with Israel. Okay, so three Jew or Gentile over the face of the earth. Five of them, Israel is the one in that covenant with God. Okay, the universal, the general ones are the Edenic, because this is before there's an Israel, and it's for the whole human race. It's established over the whole earth. The whole human race just happens to only have two people at this point, but there are head representatives. We see this in verses 16 and 17, that the Lord's going to give them specific commandments, and we're going to see that there is a test of their obedience to those commandments. We saw it already in chapter 1 and verse 28. Let's look back at that one first. Chapter 1, verse 28. Remember 26 and 27, God's making man in his own image. And in verse 28, oh, well, let me bring out the important point. Also in verse 27, it says God created him male and female. He created them. Now, we don't have Eve established yet. But it's as good as done. God sees it as done, and he's going to come out of Adam 
in God's operation <laughs> so that um, she's part of this even though we don't see her in human form yet she is part of it that's why in verse 27 even though we've not been told about it yet Eve is also created in God's image we'll see that when we have Eve created we'll understand that verse 28 God blessed them here's here's where he's entering covenant th with them God said to them be fruitful and multiply fill the earth subdue it rule over the fish of the sea over the birds of the sky and over every living creature that moves on the earth so God's given them commandments they are to be fruitful they're to multiply they're to fill the earth they're to subdue which which control the earth they were to be the the stewards over the earth and that was to be over the fishies in the sea the birdies in the sky and all the living creatures that creeped on the earth I think that covers everything that has life you know it's all under their authority I'll put it that way okay that's a universal that's a general if Adam and Eve had never sinned they would have had children okay God didn't make them to not have children children are not produced because of sin and that was in God's original plan okay and well, I won't say it now I'll say something later okay um, the Adamic covenant that follows so we're going from Eden ED oh good thank you to Adam um, you don't want one a and one you want Edenic to be one and you want Adamic to be two okay because the Adamic is a little different so we've done the Edenic, and Roger's got that up for you to sit now, and now he's putting up the Adamic, okay? And again, it's just so meaning it's A D A M I C A M Adam, and then I C on the end, just like Eden had I C on the end. Now Adam has I C on the end. Yeah. Okay. Can you see up there? If see. that helps, you can't see. Okay. Okay. I can. I can give it to you after if you didn't get it. But this is referring to Adam now in Genesis 3, verses 15 to 19. We're not going to read them now. We'll read them as we come to them. But the conditions for the life of fallen man are in the Adamic covenant. In other words, God didn't give commandment to Adam that if before he sinned that had to do with after sin because it wouldn't have made any sense or any point. You know, God gave him rules pre-sin, and then God changed the rules after he sinned. And we'll see that. And it's not that God went and changed the thing. No. The first covenant was broken. God shows Adam a second covenant. Okay, you broke my Eden covenant with you. You failed the test. You were not obedient. I'm still going to enter into this covenant with you. We'll call it the Adamic covenant. Okay, that's God's love. When we get a little further, our third covenant is Noahic. And all that is is Noah, N-O-A-H, and then just put the I-C on the end again. Okay, this covenant was with Noah, and it's Genesis 9, 1 through 17, and that's going to institute human government. Remember, if you see the chart, you had innocence, you had conscience, now you've got human government. Eden is your innocence, Adamic is your conscience, Noah is your human government. You're going to have different rules in the Noahic covenant than you had in the Adamic covenant, okay? Before they come out of the flood, out of the, off the ark, they don't eat meat. They've only been vegetarian. They've only eaten the, fr the fruits and the herbs from the trees and the shrubs. Now, after with Noah, they're going to be told they are to eat meat. Things have changed, okay? okay? We'll go into, as we come through each one, we'll explain it in full detail. I'm just kind of trying to give you an overall, okay? So, am I losing you all or are you with me? Good? Thumbs up. Okay, okay. Well, I got an okay from Dosey, so I'm okay. going to take her word for everybody. <laughs> okay? That's my Do Doseyic covenant. <laughs> Okay, now the five that are Israeli, the five that have to do with Israel, the very first one 
is called, and again, it's the ICM and, so to say it, well, you'll hear it and understand it, Abrahamic Covenant. The name Abraham, and put an I-C on the end. Abrahamic is our Hebrew, but Abrahamic. You know this covenant well. You hear this one often. This is Genesis 12, 1 to 3. I'll bless them that bless you. I'll curse them that curse you. In you, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Okay? So God made a special covenant with Abraham, even though we still don't have um, what we call the Jew. We have the area of Israel. We call it the Israeli um, one of the Israeli covenants, Genesis 12, 1 to 3. In Abraham's covenant, there's certain laws. There'll be a test. Obviously, there's a failure. We'll talk all about that when we get to Genesis 12. What we won't keep talking about in detail, I'll, I'll give you the overall as much as I can quickly. The next one is the mosaic. Now, that's the only one that changes in its spelling is M O S. A I C. In other words, you don't say Mosaic. <laughs> they called it Mosaic. M O S A I C. The Mosaic covenant you recognize as the covenant of law. God gave Moses the law. Exodus, Shmot, Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6 in general, that we know that there were many laws that God gave in the Mosaic covenant that man was to keep. Now, the third one, or well, when I say man was to keep, the nation of Israel was to keep. God raised Moses up to, to be the, the redeemer of Israel, bringing them out of Egypt. They were to be his people. They said, they, oh, we'll do. Everything you say, God, we'll do. We'll obey. And God said, if you do, I'll be your God. You'll be my people. Well, we know they fail on their part, but God is faithful on his part. The next one has a bad name for today. You have to not use the thinking of today when you hear the name. It's the Palestinian covenant. Okay? Now, there is no real land called Palestine. That's the name that the Roman enemy, after they had plundered the, the um, temple, they had taken the Jews off into slavery. Any Jew found in Jerusalem was a dead Jew. You have Rome setting up their authority. They renamed the area Palestine because that's off the word Philistine, which was the first original enemy of Israel. So they're poking at Israel and saying, your enemies got your land. We're going to call it Palestine. They, they named Jerusalem Aelina Capitolina. They <coughs> renamed, um, oh, I can't remember them all right now, but they renamed all the major cities, gave them Roman names, gave them names that, that were against Israel. The same way when they took Daniel into um, captivity. Sorry, I'm fighting for words today. When he went into captivity in Babylon, and they, they, they changed his name. You're now Belshazzar. You're not called Daniel. Daniel, why? Because Daniel would says, my God, you know, my God is judge. Well, they didn't want Daniel remembering his Hebrew roots. They're saying to Israel, you're gone. We're going to rename everything. Well, you can take a rose and you can put another name on it. You can call it a tulip. You can call it a daffodil. You can call it anything you want as long as the day is long. And guess what? It's still a rose. <laughs> it's still going to smell like a rose, act like a rose. It's still a rose. Well, Israel was still Israel. Israel is still Israel. But when these names were given for sake of study and understanding, Palestine was the name of that area. I'll tell you honestly, I hate to tell it because I'm telling on my own. <laughs> I worked when I was in my junior year in high school or senior year, one of the two, I worked for the pastor um, that the, the, I was in a Christian school and the church, we used the church facilities for our school. So on um, one of my electives, uh, being taught secretarial work, I worked under the pastor. It was my senior year. I remember, no, 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 it was my junior year. Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. My point is, he asked me a question one day. He knew about my dad. He knew about our ministry to the Jewish people, Hebrew Christian Witness. And he asked something about my dad in relation to, and he called it Palestine. 
I was mortified to hear him call my beloved Israel Palestine. But even up in the 1970s, that was an easy say from even the pastoral field. They called it by the name that Rome gave it back in the first century. And I, I just, every time I hear it, I cringe because I want to say, give it its proper name. That's not who it is. It's not Palestine. Now, why do I stress it today? Because there's a people that call themselves the Palestinians. These people say that land belongs to them, that they were there before the Jews, and it's their land. Well, number one, there isn't a land, a nation, a government, everything that's required to be a, a, a real nation called Palestine. Or people. There's not a people then either, because if you don't have the land, that's like saying there's no America, so there's no American. Well, we couldn't call ourselves American if there wasn't America. Mm -hmm. So when you're calling a Palestinian, you're saying there was a Palestine. But there was not. It was Israel. And who was there first? Israel. Israel goes all the way back. There were nations that were there that God thrust out. Nations that you don't hear about today that, that God thrust out. Go look at the, the list and you will see. And the ones that have not come to an eternal end will come to an eternal end. So when I call it the Palestinian Covenant, I have to call it that because anything that you study will call it that. But know that it really should have been called the Israeli Covenant. I mean, that's just the truth of the matter, okay? So the Palestinian Covenant we see in Deuteronomy, Davarim, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 10. Now, the Mosaic Covenant was conditional. It was bilateral. It was if you as a people are obedient to me, God, then I will bless you. But it's dependent on your obedience. The Palestinian covenant that God entered into in Deuteronomy 30, when you read in chapter 29, you will see it is unconditional and it is unilateral. That means God promised, even if you aren't obedient, I will be your God. You will be my people. This will be your land. God put his name on it and said this is his land, and he gave it to the Jewish people. So the Palestinian um, covenant is a unconditional, unilateral, totally dependent on God. That brings us to our uh, sixth covenant, I think. Where are we? One, two, three, four, five. It's our sixth covenant is our Davidic covenant. What have I missed? Because i, I got to come up with eight and and. Okay, Eden, Adam, Noah. Abraham, Moses. Palestinian was six. David is seven. We're missing something up there. Eden, Adamic, <coughs> Noah. You're missing Noah. No way. Yeah, it didn't get the no way. No yeah. <laughs> so I can count, but I We're can't up. read. After Adam. Yeah, after the Adamic is the no egg. N O A H I C. Noah, I see. There you go. Noah covenant. <laughs> okay, so Davidic is now number seven. Perfect, perfect. Okay, Davidic covenant, we see it in 2 Samuel, 2 Shmuel, chapter 7, verses 8 to 17. God promises David, you will always have one sitting on the throne and this would be your land. That's a very important one for us to realize why Israel has a right to that land and why Messiah will sit on an earthly throne. We know he's on the throne in heaven, but thy will shall be done on earth as it is in heaven. Messiah will sit on David's throne on earth to fulfill 2 Samuel 7, 8 to 17, the Davidic covenant. Okay, now we've got seven. The, these last ones, Abram, Mosaic, Palestinian, and Davidic have all been in relation to Israel. This next one is also in relation to Israel, but it's not Israel alone because there are those who are grafted in, so keep that in mind, okay? <laughs> it is called the New Covenant. This is found for us in Jeremiah, Yermia, chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. Oh my word, I just saw the clock. I had no idea class went. Oi, good fault. I'll try to finish quickly for those who need to go. I, um, 
if you need these, because I won't repeat all of it in this kind of detail of the next class, um, let they, me just get real quick to the end of it. They can save it. They can. That, that screenshot, they can save the screenshot. If okay. They, if they're on a tablet. Anyway. If you're on a tablet or something like that, you can save the screenshot. If you need me to email it to you, let me know. I could probably even put it in a text. It wouldn't be that hard. So, you know, if you need it again, I will, but... Uh, I wish I hadn't seen the clock, but I did. Okay, the new covenant, because it's so important. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, and Hebrews 8, 8 to 13. Jeremiah obviously is in what we call the original covenant. You call it the Old Testament. Hebrews is obviously in the Brit That means new covenant. This is tying the two together. What's given in Hebrews to the Hebrew people is what God gave to the Hebrew people via the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah. So it's showing you that the new covenant is not better. something... It's better. Thank you. Dora got it. It's the better covenant because Hebrews, the, the word that, the, that you can use for Hebrews is better better everything that we read about in Hebrews. Um, because I feel that it is critically important, um, I'm tempted, it's 339. I think I can read the, the verses quickly because it is that important to us. And then, um, yeah, okay, I'll do that and I'll stop there today after I read these verses and just say the little bit I need to say of it. Then next week, when we start, we'll look at the Edenic Covenant. We'll look at the requirements in the, the Garden of Eden. We'll look at the responsibilities for Adam. And then we'll look at the disobedience and the results. Okay, so we'll start. We're not going to do all those in order. We'll do some, most of those as we come to them in our study. But any of them that are left that are beyond Genesis, beyond our study, that you have questioned about, if you remember the chart, you'll get your answer out of the chart. If you need my help, let me know, and I'll be glad to spell it out for you. But right now, just turn with me quickly to Jeremiah 31. And we'll start with verse 31. And this is what Israel needs to know today because this is God and his faithfulness. This is our awesome, amazing, indescribable, loving Yehovah Elohim, both power and covenant-keeping God. Jeremiah 31, 31 says, Behold, hello, what does behold mean? Wake up. When God says it, pay attention. This is something you don't want to miss. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, there's your name, with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So who is the covenant with? It's with what we call Israel today. But like I say, that doesn't leave out you dear Gentiles because you know you get grafted in, okay? This covenant, though, with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, verse 32, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Whose covenant was that one? Abraham. Out of the land of Egypt. Who brought them out of Egypt? Oh, Moses. Very good. She gets an A+. Plus. That was the Mosaic covenant. That covenant that I had with them, my covenant, which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. He says, this new covenant is not like the Mosaic one. They broke it. I stayed faithful. I was like a husband. I stayed faithful, but they broke it. But this new covenant is going to be better than the Mosaic covenant. Verse 33, but this is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel after those days. Long past, because we know right now we're a couple thousand years past. We're more than that, 3,000 years past. Um, yeah, yeah, 3,000 years at least past the, the Egypt, Egyptian time, the Mosaic covenant. Anyway, sorry, I'm trying to hurry. Declares the Lord, I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The Mosaic Law was written on stone. It was external. Moses carried it. He showed them. Written with the hand of God, but they broke that. This, God says, I'm going to write it on their heart. It's going to be internal. I will be their God. They will be my people. They will not, verse 34, teach again, each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. That's the beauty of the new covenant. We have that new covenant in action, but we won't see the whole fulfillment because 
we're still in this time period, but God is looking at it as already done. He already sees Israel in the, their homeland with it written on their hearts, their sins forgiven. He is their, their king sitting on the throne, and he will remember their sin no more. That's future fulfillment, but God looks at it as if it is done. This is his promise. He promised it during the days of the prophet Jeremiah. He promised it for more, far more than that and with all the prophets. But here is the promise to Israel. That means an eternal, eternal home for Israel when we talk about the physical here on this earth. Okay, Hebrews 8. Going to Hebrews 8 real quick and here's where we will tie it up for the day. Hebrews 8 verses 8 through 13. Behold, for finding fault with them, he says, Behold, pay attention again, days are coming. Sounds like Jeremiah, says the Lord. When I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Every good Jewish by, uh, scripture studier at that time should have been saying, Oh, I heard these words by Jeremiah our prophet. God's referring to what he said to Jeremiah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to leave them out at the land of Egypt. Just like he said to Jeremiah. Not like back in Moses' day. For they did not continue my covenant. And I didn't care for them. I let them go into uh, punishment for it, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Does this sound just like Jeremiah? So obviously it wasn't fulfilled in Jeremiah's day. This is the promise to the Hebrew people of their greater future. They shall uh, be my people. They shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen, and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. Oh, I long for the day that everybody, all of Israel, knows their Lord from the least to the greatest of them, for I will be merciful to their iniquities, I will remember their sins no more. When he said a new covenant, he made the first obsolete, but whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. The mosaic hadn't disappeared yet, it was going to be disappearing because the new, the better, would supersede it. That's what God is saying. And notice it's I, 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 I. I will be merciful. I will remember. I will keep covenant. I will forgive their sins. I will not remember their sins anymore. I could go on and on and on. This is unilateral. This is God's faithfulness. That doesn't mean that every person living in Israel who has never turned to their Lord will get that benefit. Because remember what he said about them? I will write it on their hearts. If they don't have the circumcision of the heart, if they haven't had allowed God to, to cut their heart, then they are not going to be part of this new covenant. They have to come in through shed blood. But that is the promise, that is the new covenant, that is what gives Israel the right to that land, and why we look for the future day when the Messiah will return to the land of Israel and establish his kingdom, and the people will all in that land know their God, and they'll know to go up and worship him, and they'll know to keep the festivals that represent him, and so forth and so on. That's the new covenant that has been promised to Israel. Other nations will be blessed through it, the same way we know we, that, that God brings in, in our time, grafts in the dear Gentile into that tree whose root is Yeshua, the gift of our salvation. Okay? If there's no questions, then I'll tie it up. Are there questions? I don't see any hands. Okay. Then just in closing, we've looked at the fact that we've looked way down a quarter of time. We see that there are all these different covenants. We will deal with the ones in Genesis that we deal with, but remember the chart that I've given you before deals with all of them. If you have questions that are lingering, let me know later. But those are the, the covenants. We're entering into the very first one in our study now. Next week when we pick up, we'll start with the Edenic covenant. We'll see the requirements and the responsibilities for Adam. We'll see he fails. We'll see the consequences. We'll see what that means to us today. Why do we study it? Because he was the head of the human race. He represented us all. So what happens is 
critically important to each and every one of us and everyone born after us also. Okay? Again, my apologies. I've run late. I tried real hard to finish fast. Um, let me close in prayer quick, and then if there are questions, comments, we'll open up and let it go however long, okay? But uh, thank you, Lord. Thank you for the richness of your word. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that you are the God who keeps covenant. Thank you that even when we do not do our part, you still are faithful. Your word never fails, and the better will be what is yet to come. Thank you for those of us within hearing who have that circumcision of the heart. For any who do not, Lord, we pray they'll come to, to know you as the God of their salvation also, that they will open up their hearts and allow you to write it on their hearts so that they can be your child and you can be their God and they can reap the benefits forever also. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for a glorious future that is ours. Thank you that you're faithful to Israel and that you are faithful to those called your body. You keep your word. Oh, hallelujah. We praise you in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Okay.